Well, thank you so much, Rick. Rick's been an amazing friend and brother from the very start of this entire journey. And we thought that some super tall, thin guy from Edmonton, Alberta, would be actually making history. I mean, God has done some incredible things through me, um, whether it's uh, doing my documentary, Science Business Exposed, or putting on international flatter conferences for uh, what? People in this day and age believe the earth is flat. What's going on? So it's been, uh, it's been quite something. So uh, I'm excited. If uh, people aren't familiar with uh, me or my YouTube channel, in 2015, um, August, I, after a lot of prayer and you know, looking into this topic, I, I came to the topic in April of 2015. But by uh, August, I'm like, that's it. I always been an outspoken person. You know, one day I kind of thought, maybe I'll be on YouTube when I was speaking on some subject. But nothing ever got me to that point, even though there was some pretty passionate subjects that I talked about. Never to the point where I would create a YouTube channel. Well, I'll tell you one thing. This thing is time. And uh, I put up my channel in August of 2015. And actually, I just passed my three-year anniversary um, to celebrate truth. And what was really exciting about that was I was able to get 100,000 subscribers. And I'm now at 14 million views in total on this channel. This, this office is dedicated. The audience is so much to this office, right? This is not me. I'm just nobody, you know, guy from Canada. And I'll tell you, the calling was there. God said, go forth, and this is where you're going to go. And I mean, I tell people all the time, this is the last subject in the world that I thought, you know, I'd be speaking on. And now, you know, putting on international offices. I'm going to speak a lot more on that, just the magnitude of what's going on there. But again, because there's so many different ministries going on, God is doing so many things through me, whether it's working on Celebrate Truth, whether it's, you know, doing documentaries and working with wonderful people uh, that are even here at this conference. It's been an incredible journey. But I'll tell you, in 2016, when I said, I'm gonna get serious about this, because a lot of people don't know, they know my work as far as science is exposed, science is exposed to, and maybe, if they've been around long enough, they will look the goal a lot. But a lot of people don't know, I've got eight documentaries as well. I came out doing documentaries, and I've got quite a few on my channel, it's under playlist, you can, you can check it out at your leisure. Um, but I started doing these documentaries, and then I got to a point, okay, I'm gonna get serious. I'm gonna release stuff on DVD. I want to come up with a tool. How do you reach people without mentioning those two words, flat earth? Because that's how you, like I said, it creates a lot of different emotions in a lot of people. Um, and I wanted it as a tool. I wanted it as a resource for people to say, how do I talk to my family? How do I do things? And again, you know, I really prayed about it. And this was kind of the way to do it through scientism and really talking about it. I'd be traveling, shooting for scientists and exposed to, and I'd be talking to someone on the plane. And I'd like, what are you doing? I'm like, let's shoot a movie. Well, I'm scientist. And we'd have a wonderful talk, but I'll tell you, I said flat earth, they probably would have tried to curse you out the plane. You know, so we would have a talk around what science is, right? So to me, it was a tool to start, you know, getting into this topic and really go in that direction. Um, and it was really important for me to do that. Well, in 2016, I finally came out with the trailer. I knew that I was going to release the movie, and this is where it all changed. But I wanted to kind of go back to 2016 when I released the trailer for Scientism Exposed. That's dangerous. If you don't know, and you don't know that you don't know, that is particularly dangerous. There is no debate. Climate change is a fact. Now, as for getting your morals from the Bible, I very sincerely hope nobody does. Right now, we only can fly in Earth orbit. That's the farthest we can go. This new system that we're building is going to allow us to go beyond and hopefully take humans into the solar system. But Jesus is the Son of God who is redeeming humanity. From original sin, the idea that we are born in sin, and the only way we can be redeemed from sin is through the death of Jesus. I mean, that's a horrible idea. Let go of my mind and say a masochistic, capricious, and malevolent movie. So that's what you think of God? Yeah. How about the, the recent push to implement intelligent design in school curriculums? That's, that's very dangerous. Nature is in danger. You don't mess with, with, with the truth.
Salamat Bell Nye, the actor, again, not even a scientist, no book, no more about that, in the presentation. But uh, when I released it, it basically hit the IMDb on that big internet movie database, pretty much the authority when it comes to all movies that are released. And this topic really started resonating because to date, when I released it, um, you know, it got entered in there, and to date, I think it's still 9 out of 10. Uh, it's got over 300 reviews. It's done incredibly well. Just because this topic was grossed in a way that doesn't mention flat earth, but it really gets into many areas of science. And again, I'm going to cover mostly like cosmology and really getting into the earth, um, you know, discussion. But really, we're talking scientism as a tentacle in everything. Just look, and you'll see the scientism comes along and validates anything. Getting into morality, getting into gender, getting into GMOs, getting into climate change. And again, we can, I could do a series that would run 20 videos if we went into every aspect of scientism. But why this one is so important, this affects everyone because it not only comes down to the origins, it comes to everything that was standing on, everything that was seen in the sky. It completely decimates the Bible from Genesis right through. And again, once you start not believing in Genesis or the Word of God, I'll tell you, it falls apart. And this is the mistake you've got to plan from the beginning. Because when you can basically take something out without even lifting a finger in violence, and you're going to see more of that in the presentation, um, you definitely see how this plan was incredibly executed and disguised in something that was scientific, but what we were dealing with was religion, wasn't an, an attack, but we didn't see it for what it was. We didn't see it as an opposing view or something else to believe in. We looked at it like, well, this is the truth. You can't really argue with science. So therefore, the Bible better get in line with science or we have big problems. And a lot of the churches started backing out the scripture and saying, that's the quote, it has the allegory, because where do we go from this? We don't want to look crazy. But the reality is, whether you say on six day creation, uh, wherever you are on a literal scale, I always say that, you know, for a long time, I was a six day literal creationist, but I thought I was pretty little. But really, if you look back on it, I was probably a three out of 10. And as my journey continues, I'm getting more and more little, especially when it comes to creation. And I think, you know, everyone's on that scale somewhere. And that's why it's important not to judge where people are at. But it tells us a lot of where, where things are at. But since scientism exposed, and I'll go next week, we have more time tomorrow based on the other trailer of scientism exposed too, I was able to come up with two, and then I'm happy to announce that in a couple of weeks I'll be releasing my first book, Scientism Exposed, I Am the True Creator of Creation. And that is what is important, is because again, they are trying to hide the truth um, you know, from everyone when it comes to the truth of the true creator. When you get into you know, scientism, again, you got 1 Timothy 6.20. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science, falsely so called. I mean, there's a warning right from Scripture saying, watch out for this. And again, I've titled this on, it's on the cover of all my DVDs. Anything I do with scientism, I quote this verse. Because again, what we're seeing a lot is science falsely so called. It's, it's, it's proven, it's fact. And a lot of the stuff, whether we're talking evolution or the theory of relativity or the theory of gravity or the theory of theories, these are not proven and 100% scientifically you know, true. And again, it's important to understand that. But ancient government funded science agencies and authorities to convince mankind the stars were gods. Again, we see this all throughout the Bible. When you get into the stargazers, the Italian, the, 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 the astrologers, the soothsayers, you know, the magicians, monthly procrastinators. You know, but he came into this idea, not what the could do with the same agency and scientists today. Again, there's nothing new that happens under the sun. This has been going on for a very long time. And we're going to go back to the stars. Keep in mind that the entire stars are gods, and we're going to get into the significance of the stars, because it's a very fascinating where not only spirituality, but science is trying to take us when it comes to stars. Again, I think it's important to make the distinction with a science. Science is a method of inquiry, and the knowledge acquired by that method, the scientific method involves hypothesizing, experimenting, Observing and drawing conclusions central to the method of science is that no theory is ever considered final. All theories are subject to scrutiny and re-examination, and it is assumed that all will eventually be proven false by a more comprehensive theory. So what that's saying is science is never said, and as true scientists, you get off and they'll say, well, that's, that's true. Science is never 100% proven. Any science, uh, because again, it could be wrong. But again, we've got to a point now where they say the debate is settled, you know, there's no debate to be had. But again, what is scientism? And why did I put all this focus on scientism and how to become like the scientism guy, even though I'm trying to expose it? Scientism, on the other hand, is the belief that methods of science are superior to all and other methods of determining truth. Science believes things because they have been observed to be true. Scientism believes things because science says they are true. It is essentially a religion where its followers, scientists, worship science, its rituals, and its results. 
that clearly is spiritual, right? And I might come to surprise most people that one of the most dangerous worldviews that anybody can hold is scientism. Scientism affects every single person. Doesn't matter where you are, in your beliefs, religion, gender, race, everyone's worldview is shaped by scientism. Whatever we perceive the world to be has been shaped by scientism. It is overarching and it affects every single person. This is why it's so important. But again, we've got to a mentality where if they're right, we're wrong. You know, there's no debate. We're not even going to entertain the debate. Again, as long as you wear a white lab coat, again, who are you to question them, right? They have the, the code of credibility. And again, this is an important thing. I mean, Isaiah talks about what are those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. I say this a lot of times, and I think it's really important to illustrate, because a lot of people for many, many years, I mean, I've been a Christian over 20 years, and again, for the longest time, I mean, I looked into the lies of evolution, and it was a big part of my journey, because when I did not only, you know, believe in six-day literal or believe the Bible, but I could prove it with empirical science. It really, really impacted my faith, because here now I could do a debate. I could actually challenge people, not just say I believe in something, because I say it all the time. It doesn't matter what you believe. What matters is the truth. And this is what's important. But what you see here, you know, people will say a lot of different things. They'll say evolution, they'll say that. But what it is, is a drawing. It's a cartoon. No one has ever seen this occur. And again, it's in all the textbooks. And we've seen this. And most of uh, you know, believers that hold out to the lies of evolution, I look at it like Charles Darwin, was the fall of that. Satan actually purposely had to set up so that everyone would focus their attention on the limb, but they'd never look at the root of the tree. So they would attack this limb, bang, 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 we've got you now, Satan, we've got you, you know, or we don't know what you're doing here. But again, they would never look beyond the, the into the tree. They would just hit that limb over and over. And again, that's what evolution was. And that's why it's so extraordinary, because again, where do you get evolution? You only get evolution from a big bang, heliocentric, you know, cosmology. And again, we're gonna get into that more. But again, everyone recognizes this as a cartoon or a drawing. But again, when we got into this, what did you see here? Same thing. No one gets in this. There's not a satellite that's taking a picture of this. But again, these are in the textbooks as well. Drawing. Just, just pigments of people's imaginations. Again, here we go. Again, that's not a real picture. There's no way that could even possibly happen, even in their heliocentric construct. But again, this is what we see time and time again. It's obviously the funniest thing when I see articles all the time talking about Earth or, you know, this topic. They use pictures like this. It's not even a real picture of the Earth. Like, it's so funny that they can't even find. You know, as a film maker and as someone that edits a lot of film, I go looking for just real, you know, you just go to actually, like, stock libraries and they don't even have good images of the Earth. Even the fake glow, they don't, they don't even have real stuff. They have just all this imaginary stuff. It's like, isn't that kind of weird that you can't get tons and tons of good stock photo of, like, great footage of this spinning globe? It doesn't exist. And that's what blew my mind. But I looked into this, like, are you kidding me? We have like all these satellites, and we can't find one real picture of the Earth. Now I'll say, here's a real picture, here's a real picture. But then we've got all sorts of problems. We've got cloning clouds going on. We've got names written in the clouds. It gets ridiculous, right? But even if you don't want to take that angle, you can get into the fact that we're dealing with something very sophisticated. And why it's so important is because this is an astral attack on creation. Well, my creation is so important, we clearly see in Romans 1, 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, who hold the truth in unrighteousness, because that which may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown them unto them. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even as they it's, uh, eternal power in Godhead. So they are without excuse. Because that they knew God and were glorified him, and again it continues on basically talking, they would rather serve the creature more than the creator who is ever blessed forever. Amen. But it's interesting what it says, for they were without excuse. And I look at this like for the longest time there's been a massive deception. And I see some massive awakening happening where it's like nobody will be left with an excuse. They can laugh at this all they want. But I'll tell you one thing, he's basically waking people up everywhere and saying, I'm going to show you the truth. You can laugh at mock and do whatever you want, but I'm going to show you, you'll have zero excuse. When I showed the reality, the fact that basically when I said the earth was still, it's still. When I said these things in the Bible, you chose to sit and listen to men, and you would not listen to the plain words that a child would understand. And I said, come to me as a child. Do you think I would deceive children? Right? And again, we've done this for so long. So when I came to this, I mean, I just completely went on my knees, and I bawled, I said, Forgive me, Father. Seriously, I was living my life doing this, and really, I had to sit and make excuses for these. I didn't look into it deeper. I just had to sit there and say, but science, science. I don't look like a fool. And it's like, how did we get to a point where all of a sudden we had to listen to these scientists 
that are anti-God. They have absolute connections with the occult, which we're going to get into here in a few. And it's unbelievable that we would want to side with them rather than just say, but God said it. I don't care if everyone believes that we're flying around the universe at crazy speeds. God says the earth doesn't move. Why are we tap dancing around this when it's so incredibly clear? So for me, it was a huge awakening. But I know looking into some clips getting into the 80s, there was a really profound clip that came up. A guy in a very high level Satanism that came, came forward and kind of talked about certain things. He had got saved and he was talking about, you know, being in these high level occultic ceremonies and stuff like this. And to me, this was a very extraordinary claim he made. And I think it gets into a deeper issue, which we'll cover here in, in a few. The three things were, number one, that they did not want Satan. Satan did not want the human family to think that he or his angel existed. Right. The second point that you made had to do with taking control of people's minds. That's right. The third point was what? Was to destroy the Bible without burning. Okay. See. And what was the strategy on that? On that? Um, it was very interesting. Because after the great general council, it was decided that Satan would shooter Charles Darwin personally in setting up the uh, the principles of his theories of evolution. He was tutored by Lucifer himself, Father Lucifer. Mm -hmm. And at that time, it was understood, Satan and his uh, state counselors understood that if a person was led to believe in the theory of evolution, it would in his life destroy completely the, 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 the uh, Christian movement of the Bible, the fall of man and the redemption. It would go away. Anyone that teaches a theory of evolution is considered to be a minister of a great religious system. And he said that every teacher of that theory is recognized by the spirit as a person of great value. He is and receives a very special function from Satan himself. He has great power to induce spiritual blindness, to convince the number, to capacity. Need to be on that cover. 
we hear all the time when it comes to this topic, it's like, oh, too many people, there's too many people involved to keep this a secret. Most people would agree that evolution is a massive conspiracy by multiple people to basically keep that going. But again, is it a lot of people in a conspiracy, are they just deceived? Do they believe what they were taught? Again, the more people that know the truth, the riskier it is for Satan. Because it just takes someone that God basically all of a sudden just completely wakes up and again it's over. So for me, even people that are working for Satan, it doesn't make any sense for him to reveal certain areas. Even with the Satanists, they revealed Charles, Charles Darwin and said, look, look, the focus was on evolution. Like I said before, that was the branch of the tree. No one looked at the root. You cannot get evolution without a big bang heliocentric construct. And we'll get into that because evolution plays a role in the entire cosmology that we're involved. And when you take the literal interpretation of the Bible, you have zero evolution, period. And again, that's why this is so crafty. It's because the focus was on the biological science. And I think it's so hard to digest because every, every morning we wake up and the same earth we're all walking on, we all perceive the world through scientism. That is why it's so hard for people, even for a diehard truther, even for myself looking into anything, and I was willing to look into anything, just rock my world, literally. You know, and again, I was willing to look into anything, but I never, ever saw something like this coming. And a lot of times people will say, you know, oh, it's not scientific. And again, the big thing is science and the Bible, do they, do they call it a dick? And people say, no, 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 you know, the Bible's scientific, and everything like this. You gotta remember, when we're talking science, science no longer is pure in its form, period. Find me anywhere where the pure scientific method is conducted. When it comes to any of the topics on the media, anything that's presented in the education school system is gone. So again, yes, science and the Bible contradict when it comes to modern day scientism. So sometimes when you hear science, understand that I love science, true empirical science, but we are way beyond that. Satan has completely infiltrated something to the point where he's used the word science. But again, none of the theories are under the scientific method anymore, and they're all sold on the creator, on his creation. And that's why this topic is so incredibly important. But let's just see, you know, what Neil deGrasse Tyson has to say when it comes to science and the Bible. He don't go so far as to say that God is an ever receiving talk of scientific ignorance all the time. And I say sometimes, you know, like in quotes, like sometimes you need to hear them to believe them. Because again, these people that make these claims, sometimes it's hard to understand exactly how anti-God and the attacks they're coming at and exactly who they're coming at until you actually hear it. Again, for many of us to be attached to God, but they bang. We would be talking to someone, and again, it is pretty hilarious when you hear nothing exploded and created everything. I mean, that, that's kind of funny, right? We believe that you know, a powerful God spoke everything into existence. But we fail to recognize that we just attached the Father to a deception all along. And I think it's the hardest thing for a lot of people because for a long time we were marveling at just this amazing billion, trillion galaxy universe that God created. So again, we didn't want to take that away. But the reality was the entire construct, there was an intelligence behind it. It was the intelligence of Satan. And were we praising basically the wrong intelligence? Because any type of sophistication or anything that Satan would want to lay assault on the world, he would want people to see intelligence behind it. He would want to have some gratification going, whoa, that's amazing. Look at the way the planets move. So again, this idea that, well, well we have an intelligent design behind it. There's a creator. Well, we already know that Lucifer is incredibly intelligent. So why wouldn't we find a like, uh, fingerprint of Satan behind the deception? Very, very well crafted over a millennia, over generations. Uh, to say the least, because he doesn't work in weeks or months or years, he works over thousands of years. He's had a very long time, and again, I only have so much time in this presentation, and I'll go through more of the last you know, 500 years, but it goes way back right to the Garden of Eden, and we'll maybe get into a presentation at a later point when we get into really how far back this goes. But again, it's interesting that really the Earth really wasn't even brought up, even in satanic circles, because again, I, I think it's so deep that it really focused, needed to be on Darwin, their attack. But again, we're dealing with the deception so incredibly large. It was, oh my gosh, the uh, the universe, there's gravity and it shapes the universe in this way. And then in 1929, Hubble discovers that the universe is expanding, right? You take general relativity and the data that the universe is expanding, and a clever physicist named George Lemaitre, okay, he was a Belgian physicist, looked at that and he said, wait a minute. If we're expanding and I have this new tool, theoretical tool, to understand the whole universe, let's go back in time and ask, what would the universe have been yesterday compared to today? Right? It would have been smaller, right? Let's go even smaller, smaller. Take it all the way back. We go all the way back. We got to get down to a singular point. A singular point. At the beginning of things, right? This person is a Belgian priest. Oh. 
ordained priest. Mm, he must have drank some good beer. <laughs> old Belgian beer. Mm -hmm. I don't know that this beer in the church. I think it's all wine. Okay. <laughs> It's the, it's, it's the body and blood of Jesus, not the body and beer of Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> it's the body and beer of Jesus. I've been hanging out. Here's to you, Padre. <laughs> okay. So, so people immediately said, oh my gosh, you have found proof of, of biblical creation. Oh, really? They sent this to him. And he, a Belgian priest, came all back in their face and said, no. What? Because the Bible says the universe was created in six days. The Bible says Earth was created before the sun. There's a lot going on in Genesis that is scientifically untenable. Right. But now you want to take just a little bit that said God created it and say, oh, therefore it proves the Bible with nothing else that follows it. Right. It's any anchoring in observational science. Right. He was he was he was um, smart enough to know that this, when I say smart enough, he was sensible enough to know that this should not be invoked as evidence for God creating Genesis as described in, in, in the Jewish Bible, in the, in the Old Testament. Old Testament. So, because um, nothing else works there, right. okay? Nothing, right. nothing, right. okay? Earth is in the middle of things, everything revolves around the Earth, Earth is flat, the, 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 so, so this goes on and on and on. So he knew enough about the Bible and about science to not make that connection. Uh, we don't know what happened before the Big Bang, and we also don't know what dark matter is, nor dark energy. If you, and I've said this before, and listen to my words very carefully, mm -hmm. if you want, if your understanding of God right. flows through places where science has yet to tread, right. because these are frontiers, right. For the Big Bang, mm -hmm. if that's your concept of God, right. then the history of this exercise shows us that God would then be an ever receding pocket of scientific ignorance. Well, of course, that definitely makes sense because you're saying all these other things are provable. So, uh, and then you say, well, but what I don't know here, I just think that this is God doing this. But then our knowledge. Our bubble, our knowledge expands. Yeah. It encompasses that event. That event is no longer now attributed to God. That event is also now provable and knowable. Mm -hmm. And then that now it cannot be. So philosophers call this the God of the gaps. What's it called? Philosophers call it the God of the gaps. God of the gaps, right. So in other words, watch wherever you understand you fail to, you fill in with God. Fill in with God. Okay. So as you can hear, the scientists are talking about the fact that the Bible says that the sun, moon, and stars were created after the earth. The earth is flat, and again, these they're mocking right across the board. So these people that are like just scared to basically admit, you know, the reality of what the Bible teaches when it comes to an immovable, stationary, flat, enclosed world, again, they're nothing at all together anyway. They understand. How is it that they even recognize the fact? The Bible clearly does it. They're also far as talking about how basically they're moving away because they're embarrassed so they may stop allegory. They're actually pointing it out. And how is it that basically believers themselves can't see what's going on? They're so incredibly terrified of embracing this. And it's like, what are you scared of? Like, what are you so scared of? Like, what would be the worst thing that would happen? Again, it is an absolute assault in every single way. There's nothing taking the Bible literal. And wherever you're on the scale, you're, you're still going to rock the scientism narrative. Anyway, it doesn't matter where you're at. Six days will laugh at you just as much as will laugh at you that you don't believe the Earth moves or you're geocentric versus heliocentric. So I find it interesting when you get to look at the parallels. They are using ridicule and mockery to scare a lot of people. And again, on the scale, this flat Earth thing is the craziest thing you could possibly go. There's nothing crazy. So think about it. If you want to take God literal, when it comes to creation, if you're on that scale, that's it. There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nowhere to go. You are now fully literal when it comes to taking God's word 100% literal. If it's a pillar, you say it's cool. You don't know what it looks like, but it's literal. So to me, it's exciting. What would happen if we just took the Bible literal when it came to creation? Even people that are on the fence, why would we be so scared? What would happen? Would it be free? Would it be amazing that we just stand and have that faith and not be ashamed of anything, not listen to man, not be fearful? To me, it's just an interesting aspect, you know, it's an interesting exercise. But what's amazing is we're not just talking the Bible, we're talking about the world, and I'll get into that a lot more. How God's not just making up believers to the truth of his word. 
He's waking up people that don't even believe in him yet, and they're fighting this war. So for the first time, before it was a fight, you know, the Christians versus devil, you know, the evolution, and it's all the you know believers, you know, fighting the scientists. But now the believers are fighting the scientists, and there is just armies of people that aren't even believing in the Bible yet, and they are fighting the war. That's how big our God is, and He's the boss. This boom. Now let's see what happens. Let's hook it up and show what happened when I now have this many people bringing people out to the reality of the world. What's going to happen then? And I look back, you know, in the position I'm at, and I know all these people that they might not believe what I believe, but I'm like, you're like, you're, you're taking down evolution too? You're, you're, you're hitting NASA? You're going after the other space and you're going after these anti God, you know, these people that say the most blasphemous statements, and you're now basically on my side fighting this war? It's amazing to me. It's never happened in history. And it represents such an exciting time to be alive. This has never happened ever in the history of the world. Yes, there's been people that write books. There's people that have actually talked about this. And they were crying in the wilderness. But something happened in 2014, 2015, where not just started waking up God people, it started waking up everyone across the board. Whether they were truthers, whether they were biblical, whether they just cared about the scientific method. There's people that don't give, they don't care about the Bible, they don't care about truth or conspiracy theories. All they care about is what does the true empirical scientific method teach me about the world? Everyone just started to question the world. Like you know how long you've existed. And one just woke up one day and said, huh, I wonder if I went out and did an experiment like this real that never should come by it. Isn't that unbelievable that all this time no one just has just an exercise? Yeah, I'm bored. Hey, I thought, let's just see if we can prove it. We might be famous and get actually proved the curvature of the earth. You don't question it. That's how great this is. You don't question the world you're presented, especially when you walk on it every day. You look up there in the sky and they say, that's not. Yep. Every culture has seen the sun. Every culture has seen the moon. But we've got to a point now where scientists are telling us exactly what these things are. God is so big and so beyond us. The audacity to think that we can ever comprehend how incredible and awesome you know, he is in his creation. And just to figure it out. And now it's worth a while to just say to dissect it and try to figure every single thing, you know, that happens in the luminaries. It never does. This is marvel. You know, these are created for science and seasons. And it's not great to dissect and land on and play ball on and drive rovers on, you know. And that's a whole other matter. Getting into that idea of like, oh, if I create a light, well, I'm going to go play ball on it and, you know, drive rovers. And again, it's a massive deception when you attach God to these ideas. It's just, it's cemented in people's mind. It's such a brutal deception. But again, let's get back to the mockery, and I want you to watch this video and understand, I don't care where you are on the spectrum of literal, I would imagine it's everyone here, most likely, you know, if you're a believer, you probably are somewhere on the spectrum, and there's going to be something you believe in here, and you're not just the same. So watch this as telling, and I'll talk a little bit more about it after we get into it. Black hole, an enormous amount of gravity. They don't exist. If he doesn't say anything about it in this book, then you don't need to think about it. Our vast infinite universe has been the source of questions since the dawn of mankind. But all those questions can be answered quite easily. The answer is God. church minivan, we can go anywhere, from the abandoned horizon of a burning to the beginning of a planned parenthood. We all know God lives in heaven, but what do we see when we look to the heavens? Planets, stars, constellations. I see something. A man's face. That man is God. So God is just some old white man with a big bushy beard looking down on us from heaven? Yes. Yes, he is. Mm. But who created the heavens and the stars? God. And why would he do that? Tiss, tiss, tiss. That's not for you to question or know. We know from fossil records that our planet was once ruled by giant, ferocious reptiles. And what happened? <laughs> Nothing. They never existed. Satan put these fossils on Earth to trick you. Did he get you? Don't worry about it. It's never too late to come back and look for Satan, you won't kill. 
Baxter. Carl Sagan said, we are all made of star stuff. And he was right. But God made that star stuff. We are all made of star stuff. Except for women, who are made from the rib of a man. And what about the sun? God made it. The only sun you need to be thinking about is the holy sun. Jesus. The moon. Man walked on it. God made it. Ants? God made it. Dogs? God made it. Trees? God made it. Gay people? God didn't make them. They chose them for themselves. Cars? American made them, but God made America. Sandwiches? God made them. Everything. God made them. Well, we were supposed to do six more episodes, but we seem to have answered all of your questions in the first two minutes, so we are hoping our own of ours with some little messages for the rest of our time. I'm Jared, and I'm the average leader of the Creation Baptist Church of Alabama. Thank you for your time. God bless. So you saw the spectrum there, and everyone represents someone on the spectrum. Uh, even if it's at the very least of it, we're, you know, every woman out of the, you know, rip. Again, it's complete blasphemy and mockery and attack on every aspect. Again, it didn't even touch on flat earth in this case, but again, you can see the nonstop mockery of it, because again, science is already human. The idea that God is looking down, again, when we're talking in close cosmology, yes, he's right above us. Imagine the fact that we don't have to wonder, you know, how many billions of galaxies, and then God is beyond that, and what dimension does he live in. Regardless of how close God was in you know, each of our lives, he was still very distant, because where is he? Again, Satan eradicated even up and down, directional, basic understanding that everyone has had since the bottom of time, up and up, down and down. And even when we get into terminology in the Bible, like a tent, isn't it amazing that a tent, people understood what that was with the Hebrew, and today we even understand what a tent is. And most tents are not put on walls, put on flat surfaces. Again, this is stuff that spans the history of the world, and yet we make excuses for it, we make it completely allegory. Right? You're not going to see, God is not mocked, but whatever a man is going to that shall be also weak. Again, it's incredible to me when it comes to the scientism Big Bang agenda. Because scientism has its roots in the Big Bang cosmology and evolutionary thought. If humans have evolved by a material, purposeless process, then there is no basis for believing. And God created us and revealed moral truths for imposing those moral views in any area of our life, right? Again, the scientism Big Bang agenda using false science as a weapon. Satan has been able to shoot down the credibility and authority of the Bible. The standard assumption is that science is objective knowledge, while religion is an expression of subjective being. Religion, therefore, must subordinate its claim of the world to whatever science decrees. And what were some of the great scientific minds that decreed? Let's take the great Albert Einstein. What did he have to say? The word God is for me nothing more than the expression and product of human weakness. The Bible is a collection of honorable but still, primitive legends, which are nevertheless pretty childish. And again, this is Albert Einstein. When you're getting into the idea of scientism and basically decreeing what they deem to be the reality and the arbiters of truth, we're going to get into just basically, in a nutshell, an overview of getting the Ten Commandments of Scientism. Because you can see how crazy it's getting, and then we're going to get into cosmology. The last thing is culture. Science can provide a culture which is far healthier than the culture that's been provided by theology. Because it is based on reality. And in fact, it involves morals which are laudable, unlike the morals of all the world's religions, which are despicable if you read the Gospels. systems of all the world's traditional religions and cultures, their theories of the origins of life, humans, and societies, are factually mistaken. We know, but our ancestors did not, that humans belong to a single species of African primate that developed agriculture, government, and writing late in its history. We know that our species is a tiny twig in a genealogical tree that embraces all living things, and that emerged from prebiotic chemicals almost four billion years ago. All you have to do is change is always one generation away. And we have the children, and it's 
Exactly. So if we can plant the seeds of doubt in our children, religion will go away in generations, or at least largely go away. And that's what I think we have an obligation to do. We're left with the, real, the, the realization, of course, that intelligent design, while real in the history of science, while real in the presence of sort of philosophical drivers, is nonetheless a philosophy of ignorance. And so, regardless of what our political agenda is, all you have to say is science is a philosophy of discovery, intelligent design is a philosophy of ignorance. That's all. You know, even more astonishing is that you can get physics, you can get matter, you can get everything from nothing. They are because it seems like you should violate some law that, and out of, you know, as classic philosophers said, out of nothing comes nothing. But that's the interesting thing is that's based on common sense. But as you pointed out, the world doesn't care about our common sense. And then we've learned that the nothing of the classical Greeks and, and, and of the Bible, that eternal empty void is certainly not nothing, because empty space is a boiling, bubbling brew of virtual particles. And in fact, we discover that nothing can waste something. That's what the, in, a, in essence, the Nobel Prize that, that was given to Brian and his collaborators were here for. Nothing actually wastes something. So our, the whole idea, there's not much difference between nothing and something. So that then means that we're not looking at all. Our existence is inevitable because every possible universe, with every possible combination of physical constants and dark energy and masses of particles, every one exists. And not only that, but every one of those is being created essentially an infinite number of times and will go on being created into the indefinite future. And that is the inflationary multiverse that says our existence is how does that make you feel? The reason we love science is because it's ever evolving, morphing into more and more discoveries of the world around us. I am thankful that these advances include vaccines. I believe in vaccinations. And I believe in vaccinations. If you don't vaccinate your kids, you can endanger their lives. Potential downsides of vaccinations are almost non-existent. The cumulative scientific and medical communities are in absolute full agreement that there is basically no reason not to vaccinate the kids. No reason. Absolutely. In fact, climate change is directly related to the growth of terrorism. And if we do not get our act together and listen to what the scientists say, we're going to see country. And today is an exciting day. Because we have a guy with us who has done more, I think, than anybody else in our country to popularize science. Uh, well, that's it. So there are people who make very strong argument to me. These are climate scientists. <coughs> that uh, the, a lot of the uh, unrest in the Middle East is uh, displaced young men who don't want to work the family farm anymore because the family farm isn't doing as well as it used to because rain patterns, rainfall patterns have changed. They go to big cities, they can't get jobs, they get disenfranchised, and then they get involved in essentially terrorist operations. And this... <laughs> <laughs> Not only are that they're still alive today, that you could easily make an argument that they're more diverse than they ever have been. I mean, Living birds are dinosaurs, and just like human beings are a kind of primate, birds are a kind of dinosaur. Birds, based on the evidence we have, both in fossils and in comparison with living birds, they probably branched off a group of, of kind of carnivorous dinosaurs we call the theropods, things that are closely related to, to the animals like Tyrannosaurus or Oviraptor, the famous beak dinosaur, and some of these other unique they really shrink. <laughs> Frankly, I have been pushing NASA to uh, revamp its vision. Uh, the shuttle did some extraordinary work in uh, low orbit uh, experiments, this International Space Station, uh, moving cargo. 
But now what we need is that next technological breakthrough. We're still using the same uh, models for space travel that we used with the Apollo program 30, 40 years ago. I'd go to the moon in a nanosecond. Uh, the problem is we don't have the technology to do that anymore. We used to, but we uh, destroyed that technology and uh, it's a painful process to build it back again. This is who we were defending? This is who we were actually standing up for? I mean, I'm so thankful a lot for waking up to this because seriously, it just shows the level of what we will sink to, you know? Um, without kids being him in our lives, I mean, this is, this is the type of nonsense. I mean, all through it, this is where scientism is. This is where mainstream science is. It's getting so ridiculous that we're saying climate change is creating good amount of terrorism. I mean, are you kidding me? But the scientists already looked into it. No, four of our scientists agree. Oh, who's that? You know, who, well, who's the one scientist that didn't agree? You know, we never get to, you know, we never get to hear from that scientist. I love when I hear these statistics all the time. It's just like, oh, we're talking about three percent. I don't want to do his day. No, I mean, then. again, scientists discover. Well, who the hell are these scientists? Never did anything in the news. You think that they uh, uh, discovered something? Can you feel credit people? Like, they don't even credit people. It's like, scientists discover new galaxies. You know, the guy that supposedly discovered it, he's like, yeah, that's sweet, yeah, they discovered an amazing thing, and they ran in the news, and, well, they talked about you, didn't they? And he said, then, I discovered it. Are you sure you did not? Are you sure? Oh, I'll see it was me. Can you prove it? <laughs> so, yeah, it's just ridiculous that we got to the point where scientists discover, scientists say, Okay, let's, let's agree, let's believe. Again, 2 Timothy 4, 3, 4, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust, shall they eat to themselves teachers and itchy ears, and turn away from their ears from the truth, and shall be turned unto fables. When we're getting into Big Bang cosmology, we're dealing with science fiction, we're dealing with fairy tales or books. And again, the entire story is showing us our past with dinosaurs to the Big Bang amazingness of space to the future. Again, dinosaurs cement in children the past. It basically creates the storyline. You can't deviate from it. So dinosaurs are wonderful because the children, we learn that, we grow up, and we still love them. We're only Jurassic Park. So again, that tells us the past. Where space tells us the frontiers where we're finally going to go. We gotta get off here, they'll tell you what, because it's going to get destroyed. So, you know, how does that even work with your eschatology if you believe in other planets and we're going to one day go to Mars? Imagine the end times when you're going to sit here from Mars and all this destruction happens on the Earth. And again, you just go think of these things. Like, how does that even work? Even if they're going to colonize you know, the moon and stuff. But again, we're going to see you can't colonize, you can't go, you can't drive on lights. It's impossible. And again, one of the greatest deceptions was attached to Mars that we watched. The biggest lie of all, when I'm going to get into, uh, you know, again, we can go right back, you know, to the Garden of Eden, but for the sake of time, let's just get into the heliocentric nature. Because again, you know, someone I met to me uh, just outside before, you know, I came up here and said, you know, what's the big deal with the globe? Why is this such a bad deal, right? And again, it really, a lot of people have a hard time with this issue. But you know what? It's very, very, very simple. And I'm going to say it. Clear as I can, write it down, say it as loud as you can. The Earth is not a planet. The Earth is not a planet. Exactly. Now think, you just think, just think of exactly when you relegate the Earth to a planet, it loses significance right away. Because now it might be a cool planet because you get light on it, but again, there's billions of other planets. Again, the idea that the minute you make that sucker move, you've now become like everything else you see in the sky. The deception started with the heliocentric deception, not just to go and assault the idea of a geocentric universe, but it was to create the Earth is now a planet. And again, the Earth is not a planet. God created it special and unique from everything that we see in the sky. Everything that was created was for the Earth. The Earth was a pinnacle. It is different from anything that we see in the sky. You're going to hear time and time again, people are going to be like, but everything else is round, is the ball. We must be a ball. You ever heard that? You know, I'm sure you hear that all the time. Why? It's because in their perception, when we're talking flat Earth, they're still thinking space with the planets. So they're like, how does that work? Boom, 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 boom. We're not in space. And there's another one. Again, we've never been floating in space. We're not moving, but the Earth is not a planet. And you're going to see that the deception came to this point because the minute it started moving and orbiting and doing anything, it's now a planet. It's now orbiting. 
And again, we can go back to the 9th century, with the first heliocentric model. This is way back, guys. It happens way back. And for, for sake of time, I'm not going to be able to go into it. But again, you can look into these figures. We're going to get into the most prominent when we're getting into Aristarchus, getting into 310 BC, 230 BC, right? But leading up to Copernicus, a lot of people have seen this, and this is exactly where it really took hold. So there were attempts going on, and again, people look at it like, well, what's the big deal? The big deal was making the Earth a planet. Because once you do that, you submit it like everything else. The discussion is over. It's done. There is no looking at anything. We just know we're a planet, and we have life on it. But we're now discovering, scientists just discovered yesterday, there's, you know, 50 more planets that, that basically have life. Maybe we're going to, you know, find out other life forms. And we'll get into that, you know, tomorrow, getting into where this is going. It's preparing us also for something to come. So let's, let's look at the Copernicus and learn a little bit about him if you're not familiar, because it's extraordinary exactly the power and what Satan was able to do through Copernicus. Pictures of medieval cosmology, then you see not only the Earth and the planets, but the outer sphere beyond that, you would have heaven. So that the Earth was considered to be at rest ultimately with respect to heaven, with respect to the throne of God. For 1500 years, Ptolemy's system was used as the basis of astronomy and calendars, and it worked quite well. But there were always those who detested its departure from the purely uniform, circular motion, assumed to be perfect and appropriate for heavenly bodies. Among these was Nicolaus Copernicus. Copernicus hated that, and Copernicus set about to undo Ptolemy's greatest discovery. While working at the request of Pope Leo X on improvements to the Julian calendar, Copernicus conceived what turned out to be the foundational idea of modernity itself, the idea that the Earth moved. The Earth moved, and yes, relegating it to another planet like everything else. But then we have an interesting character called Heckel Brahe, and he came up, and he wasn't fully convinced. Not all were persuaded by Copernicus, however. The greatest astronomer of the time, Tycho Brahe, developed a new geocentric model. The Earth occupies the center, the planets orbit the Sun, and the Sun orbits the Earth. Tycho Brahe, who is a great unsung hero of this, because he did a, an immense number of observations, very accurate ones, very precise for a long period of time. Well, the Tychonic geocentric system, the sun is traveling around Earth literally and carrying planets with it. So the sun is making the ecliptic, it's not the Earth. And if you ever want to basically get a person a resource when it comes to the documentary The Principle, these are clips from The Principle. And again, while they're not flat earthers, they definitely make a really strong case for geocentrism. And again, for me personally, it woke up many, many people. I know a lot of people that are already geocentric. They're still not perfect their soul. They're still doing their investigation when it comes to the whole flat earth thing. And that's fine. Give people the time. Because again, this is a radical topic. And again, it hasn't been covered for a very long time. This thing has been disguised. And again, we have to look at it that way. Again, getting into Johannes Kepler, we, we have an interesting character as well, too. And, you know, how it all transpired. The young assistant named Johannes Kepler in 1600. Kepler, working on his own development of the Copernican system, needed Tycho's observations, but Tycho refused to part with them. When Tycho died suddenly and mysteriously in 1601, Kepler took charge of Tycho's observations and used them to develop his own system. Kepler's great insight was that the sun must be playing a significant role in the motion of the planet. They are following many definite paths, we know that for sure. How on earth do they do it? And what moves them? So he said, the sun must be somehow causing them to go around. So he postulated that the sun is rotating and had sort of spokes which somehow got weaker as he went further from the sun. In Kepler's system, the sun is in the center while the planets move on ellipses, not uniformly. The ellipse, with its two foci, allows us to see that Ptolemy's epicycles and equant were actually a brilliant attempt to express non-uniform motion 
centuries before capture. Indeed, once the concept of non-uniform motion is introduced, all of these systems can be shown to be geometrically identical. It was Kepler's idea that the sun must somehow be moving the planets in their orbits that set the stage for Isaac Newton's great breakthroughs. But observational tools equal to the task would first have to be developed. With Kepler, we understand that when it came to Kepler and even the, the, the men that were discussed, it was already assumed now that the Earth was a planet, and they were looking at different ways scientifically to bring it together as far as geocentric. And again, there is a lot of supporting evidence to support the fact that we are in a geocentric, you know, model. Now, not just biblical, the science is supporting it. And the principle, they've done a fantastic job at showing you just the science um, of supporting the geocentric model. But understand that by the 1500s, in the last 500 years, it was already assumed the Earth was a planet. Again, one of the greatest deceptions is the idea that the Earth is a planet. Follow it back. Understand what that means in many, many areas. Because you're going to find that all of history, even everything we saw in the sky, we were considering the, the quote-unquote planets, which is not found in the Bible. They were considering the wandering stars. So where in history was the Earth ever considering, uh, considered a wandering star? If planets were wandering stars forever, when was the Earth ever considered a wandering star? It never has been. But again, it's a very deceitful move to actually transition the Earth to a planet. And I stress that because again, the deception had already been put in place. Now they were working with models. The state had already cemented the idea, knowing that they would argue that it would go back and forth and eventually it would win out. But now, the Earth was not special. The Earth is not special as a planet. But you try to make an argument based on the fact that even you have to understand that if there's billions and trillions of galaxies, and God must create, there must be a lot of different creations out there, Again, maybe they're not simple, you know, because again, you know, the Messiah came once and once for all, you know, here. And I used to look at all these ideas, you know, about creating billions and trillions of galaxies, we must be able to like ones, you know, creating. Maybe they're not coming here. I mean, obviously, the whole alien agenda is a big deception. But again, you have to bring in other life forms. Again, if there's trillions and billions, the idea that they have to, you know, they have to exist. And again, as time goes on, more and more people are actually looking into that as it has to be plausible. Again, the Earth is not a planet. The Earth doesn't look like anything in the sky. The Earth is not a light. And again, that's a really important thing to stress. Because what did he create? Sun, a moon, and also stars. What do all those things do? They light up. They're lights, right? Where are planets found? Planets are not found in the Bible. The only time it's mentioned is talking about the constellations. Planets are not found. Now, you're telling me of millions and billions and trillions of planets and the amazing range of Saturn, and this is an awe-inspiring, amazing creation. Why is it, why are they never mentioned? Not for all civilizations are seeing the same thing. You think it would be very easy, you know, say that they're not mentioned, and yet we're making excuses time and time again, because, well, they, they have to be real, and they're like that. They're out there, the question is, what are they? What's extraordinary is we get into all the scientists, and again, you can just basically do your own study, you get into Pythagoras, and again, getting the Pythagorean theorem when it comes to basically studying the calculation of the curvature rates of the Earth, right? You can get Galileo, you can get Copernicus, you can run the gamut and you find connections with the occult, with the mystery school, esoteric knowledge. I mean, these guys are getting pivotal, profound changes in the psyche of humankind when it comes into the radical shifts and changes when it came to cosmology and understanding our worldviews. These guys are getting it, you know, from very dark means, mystery school, the occult, and yet, we have brought these guys up. And, oh, that's amazing. And even the guys that go, well, wasn't uh, this guy a Christian? No, man, it wasn't at all. When you do the research, you find out they have completely different gospels, different ideas of, of who Christ was, all these sort of things. You get even duped, like, oh, well, one was a Christian, yay, you know, we've got to prop him up because it's amazing, so he ain't going to be lying to us. How many people would be in on this deception? How many are in on it? I'm teaching us that we came from apes. We came from monkeys. I mean, People, you know, are, are waking up to the, the idea that, wait a minute, no, this is crazy. Yet when they, they don't want to let go of the ball, they don't want to let go of space, it's just it's incredible. And I understand that being a big fan of Star Wars and Star Trek and all these ideas. But there's something so profound. When all of a sudden it's like safety blanket. This is what you've known your whole life. Thank you, God, for giving me this. I love the earth. The is amazing. And someone's trying to rip it away from you. You know, it's a very threatening thing to lose your entire worldview. Again, that's why this topic is really important to try to really uh, feel carefully with different people. 
Because again, you can't just come to this one too strong on this. It is incredibly profound to wake up to the knowledge of everything that you have been taught. It wasn't just evolution, it wasn't just biological sciences, all the sciences have been corrupted. Satan used them as a battering ground to completely you know, take his agenda to the fourth degree when it came to taking out the credibility of family authority and the foundations of the Bible. Because once you start, did God really say that? Everything else is up for debate. And again, it's very clever the minute you start looking at stuff and making excuses for it. Well, well that must be poetry, because that doesn't work with the science you just discovered. Again, it's a sad day. And soon we're coming to a point, I don't know how long it's going to be, but people are going to have to pick a side. For a while, people can sit on the fence as long as they want. But there's going to come a day where God's going to challenge people saying, where do you stand? Do you stand with the Bible or do you stand with men? It's coming. It will happen. God is not just making people up for the sake of it. Everything that was, you know, held in darkness will be exposed. And the idea that no man will be without excuse, the idea and the amazing favor of showing how powerful that he can just in a split second start waking people up to something so profound as the earth, as everything that we've been taught about the luminary, the sun, moon, and stars, has all been a lie. It's all been a direct assault from the enemy, the adversary. To me, it's incredible. But even the scientists themselves, they'll have given their own words. That what they're seeing now, dark matter, dark energy, quantum, all these sort of things, into even the Big Bang. Wait a minute, there's a spirituality attached to this. Again, this is Mitchell Baku, and again, it's incredible what he starts off with other scientists admit when it comes to a lot of the scientists that are being crammed down our throats and our children, you know, when it comes to the education. Again, even in homeschooling materials. They've got the solar system and planets and Big Bang cosmology. Surely not, we don't get that evolution thing. But you got the 19 year olds and the planets and all these sort of things. Again, it's something to look at and it's something that's important. Saying, look, what are we teaching our children? Is it fine? Is it conclusive science? Or could it be the reality that, wait a minute, maybe we should take seriously what is next to 20 times if the Earth doesn't move? Maybe it doesn't. Why is it over and over and over again saying the Earth doesn't move and yet we're making excuses, but, but, but science said it does. And we got pictures from NASA showing it's sitting. You know, again, how much proof are we going to need to basically just rely and trust in the Word of God? And this is what's amazing. We're seeing it from all different walks coming forward and railing against the lies of the enemy. Not just biblically, scientifically, you know, truth is people from every walk, every race, every, it's incredible to me. And I hope that I'll get a time here again just to talk about, you know, with the Flat Earth International Conference, you know, what's going on there. But let's hear from the scientists exactly how they're seeing modern day cosmology and what's being crowned on our throats. I'm a theoretical physicist, and I like to say that I walk in the footsteps of giants like Albert Einstein and Neil Bohr. I'm not a philosopher. However, I am rather baffled by the fact that many of the basic mysteries that we find in string theory and the theory of everything seem to be mirrored, mirrored in the Zohar and in the Kabbalah. And the sky, the most amazing thing of all is the degree to which modern astrophysics sounds like a Kabbalistic text. When I first made the correlations between Kabbalah and science, I was stunned. We do know that Isaac Newton had access to certain mystical texts, certain texts of the Kabbalah. Well, the Kabbalistic description of creation is coming from a single flying from spec and of having matter form and time and space form all together at the very beginning, it sounds very much to me like the description of the Big Bang. I couldn't believe that the Kabbalists could derive these truths without really knowing any mathematics and physics. All the things that could destroy string theory, all the things that do destroy every rival theory of string theory, they all eliminated in precisely 10 and 26 dimensions. These dimensions are magic. These dimensions are magic. We physicists don't know where these dimensions come from. The Zohar says those things because it's been a lucky guess. I don't know. It's rather amazing. This uncanny reflection of some of the most advanced cosmology that are mirrored in Zohar and ancient Kabbalistic. Again, these guys are admitting the fact that where this is coming from. They're seeing the uncanny resemblance of, you know, even just coming from the Big Bang. It's important to understand that we attach the wrong creation to the true creator. To me, this is the important deal, is because we attach the creator to everything that we were taught. And we need to go back right to the start. We need to go right back, not looking at the branches and attacking the branches of evolution in Charles Darwin. We need to look at the roots. What are the roots 
not looking at just the branches. What is the roots of this tree? And when you go right back to the beginning and you go right back to the big bang, you find that everything has been a deception right from the start. And again, we always hear science versus religion, science versus religion. Again, if you non-stop lie, the idea has always been science versus God. And when I say science, I'm talking about scientism and the fact that this has been set up to completely go against God, to go against the true creator. And for so long, we have been trying to put science and God together in the Bible and it must be there and making excuses for it. But again, over and over and over, it says the earth doesn't move. Over and over and over, it says these things. And why is it that the scientists themselves can recognize what the Bible says? Why are we making excuses when we'll hold on to one area and say, well, that's never all, that must be allegory, but that's embarrassing that we even will tell her because I'm totally working on a ball. It's time to ask you to look at the text for what it is and say, wait a minute, what happens hypothetically if I was going to take the Bible literal? What's amazing is nothing contradicts. You get a Hebrew cosmology, you get a dome with pillar, everything comes together. There's nothing that contradicts. The worldwide flood with Noah makes sense. The Tower of Babel starts to make sense. A lot of the stuff in the Bible were like, hmm, wait a minute, they're building this tower, and all of a sudden it's like, wait a minute, we gotta go down and compound their language. I mean, on a spinning ball of trillions of galaxies, what kind of threat is that? Building a little tower, these little men, can you imagine, you know what I mean? Building this whole tower. But there was a threat. If you read that verse very clearly, something was very significant. Whatever they now believe, they will achieve. Why was it a threat on a spinning ball flying through space and being thrown into galaxies? There is no way they would ever reach the throne of God. But if he's a lot closer, just like we're talking about when it comes to the literalists of the Bible, could it be that it's that simplistic? Could it be that literally God is up on a spinning ball flying through space where it's up? Again, they've eradicated Satan has basically leveled his assault on every aspect of the Bible. It bores me to the fact that it's like, well, you know, I'll just do a couple of things. Every single verse when it comes to creation has been twisted, turned upside down, and perverted. And Satan has no power whatsoever to change creation, to change reality, to change truth. But what his power is, is to lie. And the minute he whispers, he says, I know it looks that way, but it's not true. That's power. His only power is lies. He's the father of all lies. You, you clearly see this in scripture. And again, knowing that basic creation is the number one way without the revelation of the word of God to know the true creator of creation, what do you think you're going to be attacking? You're going to lay assault to it left, right, and center. It is going to show the true creator of creation to everyone. Without even having the word of God, they're going to clearly be able to see things. Like the fact that, wait a minute, all of our senses have been created, and the fact that no one's felt any movement. And you start looking into these speeds, you start looking into even the orbits that we're, we're speeding up, slowing down, but yet we don't feel anything. All this trust is we are, you know, it's gravity. And again, we would get into that tomorrow when it comes into gravity. And all this stuff is gravity, it's gravity. It's the least scientific thing there is. Sure, they'll say we know the effects, but it's never been measured, tested, seen. It is the least scientific type of thing you can possibly imagine, and yet it's excused for everything. Hey, how does it serve to help gravity? Uh, what about the planets in the uh, you know, galaxy 8614? Well, that's gravity. Everything's gravity. It's like a big G for them, right? And they use that to basically secure their narrative constantly. You see this over and over and over again. And tomorrow, I'm going to get into it further, showing the agenda when it comes to space, when it comes to the idea of what's going on. But I just want to close in saying that something big is happening. Again, why is the super tall, thin guy from Edmonton, Alberta, you know, Creating international conferences, the first in history in Raleigh, North Carolina last year. I just finished doing the first one in Canada in my home city, you know, two weeks ago. I'll be doing Denver, Colorado this year. I have more planning. And again, this is just a quote on my life. I'm not doing documentary. I'm doing celebrate too. Also, this guy, it's this, you're going to give me this. Like, well, this is a whole other avenue. But you tell me this. What other area, anywhere in, in any type of biblical mindset, do you have CNN, BBC, you know, ABC Nightline, HBO running to cover? Do you understand that we were the first one we did in Raleigh, North Carolina, the first one ever in the history of international conference in the States? What was really incredible to me was just the one alone. I mean, there was BBC, I mean, the, uh, I think it was the Australian Herald came in. We had international press coming in, and they're covering it, right? And then all they are, whether they're mocking it or not, they're proclaiming God's word. They're saying the littleness of Genesis. They're talking, they're quoting Genesis. Tell me any other thing when the media is just putting on Bible verses into their articles. I mean, what was incredible with ABC Nightline 
when I did the conference, the first letter for international conference in Hollywood, North Carolina. You know, I was interviewed, Rob was interviewed, and again, Rob and Steve would even agree that out of the hour, and we were interviewed for a long period of time, but even out of that interview, the parts that they picked, he couldn't pick better parts, because you knew they were going to share picks, and he looked like a crazy nut job. He said, out of that hour, the little piece that they put in the clip, he couldn't pick better ones, if he had all the choice in the world. They did a phenomenal job, but what was amazing is over 30 million people, they have aired that on ABC Night like three times, it has gone viral on the internet. This is just one example. And yet, God's word was displayed there. The Bible was shown. Even testing the globe was shown. 30 million people about this issue. In Canada, I had the internet. I had national. I had local. I had French. I had, I had the biggest magazines. I had global news coming in. They're covering this thing. And if you look at the, if you look at all the press that came out, oh, here's the Christian. This guy believes the Bible is true. You don't do that. If anything, fine. If I'm remembered in history for just standing on the word of God, that's the way I'll go. You know, if my biggest offense is like this guy, so okay. you know, For the word of God saying, no, I don't really care anymore. It says it doesn't move. And again, we don't want to be embarrassed with it because again, you've got teams of people that don't even believe in the Bible that are validating and saying, that's exactly what the true science is showing. That's, and I'll get into it a lot more when it comes to experimentation. Whether it's Rob Skiba and Greg Hummer, you know, on a boat checking out the mirage, and there's like, oh, the atmosphere for crashing and they're lensing and stuff. But now you're getting into like microwave technology and infrared, which you can see even further away. On a ball of 24,900 miles of circumference, it's an impossibility. We've been lied to, period. And it will come a point, I think, for believers, at a certain point, when are we just going to be have that peace and going, I don't need to see any more proof. You know, I remember talking to Steve about a few times, and I said, you know, wait a minute, at what point where we could just going to be like, I'm good, I'm good. I don't need to keep testing and testing and testing, and I know all that army behind us, the ones that are not knowing who they're fighting for, you know, they're like, there's a crater, I don't know what you're you know, they're all on our, our side right now, they're not even there yet, it's, it's extraordinary, but again, where is this heading? And to me, we're in a remarkable time in history. The world is going through an absolute paradigm shift that I've never seen. It is the greatest witness of opportunity I've ever seen in my entire 20 years of ministry, being involved in prison ministry and youth ministry and everything, and being very, very passionate about thinking of evangelism. I have never seen more receptive people that are 100% convinced there's a creator, I'm unique, I'm special, you know, teach me more. Coming to the Bible every day, I get testimonies constantly of people. Constantly saying, wow, I just went and bought my first Bible. Do you know like it's 2015, it didn't matter who it was, everyone ran out and bought a Bible. You tell me anything else in the truth or community, it's like 9-11. Wait a minute, I don't know why I can't get a Bible. So what is this? You know what I'm talking about? The truth of community is in droves. The minute they come to the top, they're like, I never even looked at a Bible. I never got one of these things. Whoa, look at this. It's said it all along, right? So it's an incredible time. We have a huge, huge responsibility and opportunity. So while, while we're sitting here worrying about like, oh, I've got to convert my family, I've got to tell my thumb, understand there's tons of people that want to hear. Focus on them. If someone doesn't want to listen, that's fine. Hey, I've got work to do. I'm not going to waste my attention on someone that's just ridiculing and laughing. I mean, this person over here wants to know more about our great God, right? It's an amazing, amazing time in history. And again, we have just seen a very, very start of because when it comes to a remnant, when it comes to an awakening, this law, we're at the very, very beginning stages. And again, it doesn't happen over just a couple of years. A hundred months for 40 years, and even longer. So in the history of us, we look back, and it's the biggest thing that we're going to be accused of, that guy believed the Bible was literal. Count me in, and hopefully you'll be with me. Thank you so much.